Okay, I am hitting record now. That should be going. Got one more person trying to get into our breakout room. So, um, come on in. Rose, it's, it's record. It has been recording all the while. Uh, we're we're doing a couple different versions. Um, okay. so we've got one that's just running the whole time. Uh, okay. That will that will not be made public. Um, but then for uh, the ones that I that I'm recording, the spot panels okay. uh, will do it you. that way. Thank you. Um, and then let's see, Roxana, can you find our panelists and make sure that they are uh, co-moderators in this group or whatever we need them to be? Um, I'll be spotlighting them. And since we can't really do any additional like breakout rooms from this breakout room, then they'll they will be fine. How much more time do we have in the break? Uh, we are going to start right now. That was nothing. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. Oh well. All right. Let me uh, let me get started and invite everybody to to mute. Um, my name is Rose Marie Berger. And I am pleased to be the uh, moderator of this session. Um, this session is the nonviolent strategies in today's social movements. So if you're in the wrong session, I, I don't know what to do for you because I can't boot you out. Um, this panel is, as you know, is part of our full day of events uh, called Nonviolence, a Tradition for Our Transformation, hosted by the Catholic Nonviolence Initiative, which we heard about earlier today. And uh, Roxana, maybe you could drop in the, uh, the CNI website link again into this chat. And all of this is our lead in to the, to the really fantastic uh, national conference that's, that Pax Christi USA is putting on tomorrow um, with, I'm delighted to say that keynoter or whatever's the right name for that will be Olga Segura, who I'm really looking forward to hearing. I am uh, an editor at Sojourners Magazine, senior editor. And Sojourners is a, is a ecumenical and evangelical organization dedicated to faith in action for social justice. I'll hold up uh, our magazine here, uh, if you haven't seen it. Um, this is the most current issue and it's a good one for this group because it's all on the art of Corita Kent who was a Catholic sister, very involved in social movements uh, and a very uh, provocative and profound artist. So if you aren't familiar with Sojourners, I would say go to sojo.net and, uh, and get a subscription um, or at least get this issue because it's got some really great stuff in it. We don't always write on stuff that's of particular interest to Catholics, but this one definitely is. See, um, I've been working with the Catholic Nonviolence Initiative since uh, it began in 2015. And as Marie so stated, stated so clearly, the mission of the Catholic Nonviolence Initiative is to affirm the vision and practice of active nonviolence at the heart of the Catholic Church. And our goal is to really encourage a major teaching document from Pope Francis on Catholic nonviolence, uh, as, as Marie talked about. I'm uh, the co-editor, uh, along with Marie and Judy Code um, and Ken Buttigan, uh, of the book, Advancing Nonviolence and Just Peace in the Church and the World. And that's really, that's, sometimes people don't like it when I call it this, but that's our people's encyclical <laughs> um, on Catholic nonviolence that we've worked on for the last five years, which really gathered the best uh, Catholic voices on nonviolence from around the world, contemporary thinking on nonviolence uh, within the Catholic tradition from around the world uh, after a four process, listening process, global listening process. We compiled all of that um, thinking, creative ideas, practices, failures, questions, 
suggestions uh, into a book that we really hope will become sort of the primer on Catholic nonviolence uh, for use in parishes, schools, communities, um, about how to deepen active nonviolence as a, as a practice of our faith. Um, for myself, after 35 years in Washington, DC, I returned this summer to Sacramento, California, to the American River watershed. Um, and I am in land traditionally held by the Nisenan Meidu people. And one of their current projects is to uh, stop the dams that are being built on the American Sacramento rivers um, in order to protect their sacred salmon. And so as we, uh, as we deepen our practices of nonviolence, uh, for me, one of those is being aware um, not, not only of the violence and nonviolence um, sort of laterally around us, but in the deep history of the place where we are located. And as you've seen, we're collaborating today with uh, Roxana Bendezu, who's the program director for Pax Christi USA. And she's running the tech side of our conversation and monitoring the chat. Um, if you have got questions about Pax Christi USA uh, or the national conference or anything else about Pax Christi's programs, please just, um, direct your question to Roxana. And certainly, I'm gonna make a big push here. If you would like to make a financial contribution to Pax Christi USA to help underwrite the expenses for this gathering, uh, Roxana can accommodate you. Uh, we'll drop the link in the chat um, and we're, we're happy to, to pass the hat and we're happy to receive anything that, uh, that you can give. So let's move to our topic. Um, our schedule for this panel and our, our format will really be to, to listen, to ask, and to discern. So we'll listen to some framing remarks from our panelists on current nonviolent social movements. Um, I'll, I'll introduce the panelists. Uh, and we can all be formulating questions in our notes and in the chats and and in our, in our hearts as Jeanette really uh, opened for us this morning, um, this afternoon, I'm, I'm in California. Um, and then after all the panelists have spoken, we can share our questions in the, in the chat and I'll facilitate the responses and uh, we'll sort of discern together um, through putting feedback in the chat. What, what have we heard in this conversation that was new? Um, where do we hear a lot of unity? Are there particular problems uh, that will take time for us to unravel? Sort of naughty problems, uh, as in wicked problems, things that are just sort of complicated to un untangle. And then as always, what did we hear that caused our hearts to burn within us, um, indicating a, a presence and a, a nudging of the Holy Spirit? So we're going to start uh, today with um, hearing from our friend uh, Leo Cuadrado. Uh, he, Leo teaches at Fordham in New York City. He's originally from El Salvador. Um, his research examines the religious tradition and practice of church sanctuary as a source for ecclesiology. And he wrote a, a great chapter in, in the book. Uh, the book title is A Just Peace Primer. And his chapters, Just Peace, Just Sanctuary, Immigration, and Ecclesial Nonviolence. I just love that chapter title. Um, and it's also got an article in, in the most recent theological uh, studies magazine called Sanctuary for Asylum Seekers, Revisiting the Religious Principle and Practice of Refuge in the Church. And uh, in a second, I'll drop the links to those in the chat. And a part of that article is, is Leo arguing why we should reinsert the practice of sanctuary into canon law in the Catholic Church. Uh, Leo lives in the Hudson River watershed in New York on an island of Manhattan, uh, otherwise known as Manhattan, traditionally held by the Lenape people. So Leo, I 
will turn it over to you for just you know five minutes or so on uh, the church practice of providing sanctuary as as part of our nonviolence response. Great, thank you, Rose. And it'll probably more, be more like seven minutes if that's okay. That's fine. Um, can everyone hear? Just to make sure. Okay, great, thank you. I'm going to share my screen and um, take you through about eight images as I speak. And I hope that the technology works. So church sanctuary is a nonviolent response to the transnational violence that forced, forcibly displaces communities. At the heart of sanctuary is migrants and asylum seekers themselves affirming their humanity before the church and before the state. So let me begin not in the US, but actually in Belgium. And you should be seeing a picture there of mattresses in a church. At the end of January of this year, a few hundred migrants and asylum seekers, many of them from North Africa, from Afghanistan, and from other countries in the region, took refuge in a Roman Catholic church, the Church of St. John the Baptist at the Beguinage in the capital city of Brussels to denounce the government's deportation policies and its refusal to grant them some form of a process for legal existence in the country. In May, they began a hunger strike. This month, July, some of them sewed their lips together, a symbol that communicates the way that the truth of migrants and asylum seekers is silenced. A few days ago, the Belgian government finally agreed to reassess their possibilities of having cases, immigration cases within Belgium. The six month process of living in the church, of garnering national and international support, of having a space from which they could communicate their stories and their truths, the six months of networking and collaborating with ecclesial and civil organizations, and their willingness to suffer in the struggle for their existence is all part of a broader local and global movement where churches and church communities become sanctuaries for life in the midst of the legalized violence of the state. The priest in charge says of the church, Father Daniel Allier, who in fact collaborates with those that others simply call occupiers, he says, for them, it's a question of dignity. They don't want to die. They want to be recognized. I'll just draw your attention to the dining table that you should be seeing right in front of the tabernacle, the altar area. The liturgical and sacramental um, confluence there, I think, is utterly profound for how we think about church and sanctuary. So in the US, the Trump administration, um, during the Trump administration, there were close to 50, 50 public sanctuary cases that were spread across the country. Persons at risk of deportation took refuge in churches that recognized that deportation not only places their life at risk, but that it also separates them from their families and children. In some of these cases, grassroots immigrant organizations facilitated the encounter between persons in need of sanctuary and churches willing to offer sanctuary. In other cases, those at risk of deportation literally knocked on churches asking for refuge. One example in a case of Arizona with which I worked, a Roman Catholic woman went to various Roman Catholic churches asking for protection only to be told that the church could not protect her because it was illegal. A mainline Protestant congregation down the street ended up providing her sanctuary, and she remained on the church property for over a year until negotiations with the government led to a stay of removal or a stay of deportation. The example of Roman Catholic churches rejecting sanctuary seekers is not unique. For example, in Philadelphia, a Mexican Roman Catholic woman who knew that ICE was going to come for her was not able to find sanctuary within the spaces of her own denomination, but a historically black church was willing to stand with her, aware of their shared historical struggles to exist in a country that systematically persecutes them. It is no accident that in the 1980s, sanctuary was also called the Underground Railroad, linking it to the movement in the 1800s. 
and they are the images of Jim Corbett, one of the leaders in the sanctuary movement in the 80s, helping uh, a woman with a pseudonym of Juana crossing into Arizona. As we think about US histories of racism and colonialism and the fact that most, if not all those seeking sanctuary do not belong to whiteness, sanctuary practices become a means of non-cooperation with the legalized structures of these historical evils that continue to live. Churches that provide sanctuary, in fact, become sites of truth telling, where the government's unidimensional narrative is contested and where the local community carries out what the government fails to provide. Protection from violence and a vision of a society built upon social cohesion that does not end at the borders of a nation state. The movements for sanctuary taking place here in the US and globally are more than resistance to violence. They are a positive force, a constructive program, Gandhi would call it, that points to new possibilities for being human together. Yet, those involved in the movement ask why a denomination with 17,000 parishes across the country refuses to open its doors for those whom ICE is persecuting, many of them from that denomination. And here you should be seeing a woman, Amanda, here in uh, Northern Manhattan, you seeing a blessing as she went into sanctuary. You should be seeing her kids playing in the church sanctuary with Mary in the middle. And lastly, it is an image of her youngest celebrating his own life in sanctuary and not separated from his mother. So I will end with that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, that was very, it's very powerful. And I, I want to just help us uh, by mentioning a, a couple things that I heard. So we start with the images in Belgium and the, the occupiers in the Catholic Church. Um, so how do we hold the dissonance of that, uh, that the arms of Mother Church should be open to all? And, and yet here's a, an example of uh, people needing to sort of force their way in um, the brutal image of, of, the, of the lips, um, violence of that, uh, of that self-inflicted wound in order to try to make it clear to those beyond what they are, what the wounding is. Um, the, the, the question about the Underground Railroad being a language used for an earlier sanctuary movement um, and, and linking it historically. Uh, and so the importance of setting our current uh, context, our current social movements in a historical lineage. Um, and, and what, what, is that, what, what does that gain uh, for us? Why, why is it powerful to claim a certain historical uh, lineage or stream? Um, there are times when that's not helpful. Um, sanctuary as non-cooperation with state-sponsored uh, violence. So that's, that's a lot, there's a lot to unpack just in that understanding what state-sponsored violence is, understanding what the language of non-cooperation uh, means. Um, and then this idea of, 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 a, of a civil a civil action um, where civilians are stepping forward to do what the state is supposed to do, but has failed to do. Um, or in other examples, civilians stepping forward to act in a humanitarian way, despite state boundaries, national boundaries, um, particular political structures. Is that a space that churches move in uh, differently than perhaps secular or civic organizations? Because we have an understanding of the body of Christ beyond 
uh, beyond certain boundaries. Um, and then, yeah, just the very real facts on the ground, 17,000 Catholic parishes uh, in the United States. Plenty of room, plenty of good room in those churches. And how, how should we think about the, that physical space um, of our churches and what they mean and uh, what is the first priority, the first call? Uh, of the church in terms of um, uh, hospitality. Let me uh, move us along to Anne McCarthy, uh, who will go next. Anne is a Catholic religious sister in the Order of St. Benedict, part of the Erie Benedictines. Um, she coordinates Benedictines for Peace in Erie, Pennsylvania, and is on the staff of of Bennett Vision, which many of you will be familiar with through Joan Chittister. Um, she's on the staff of the Monasteries of the Heart, which is a, a wonderful uh, experiment in early, early experiment, um, as we expect from the Erie Benedictines in how to build online community, uh, especially in nurturing faith and spirituality. And was a uh, previously the national coordinator of Pax Christi USA and is on the board of monastic interreligious dialogue, um, which looks at, at, uh, at monastic entities uh, around the world. She's an active contributor to the Catholic Nonviolence Initiative and attended our first uh, gathering in Rome in 2016. And I, I, I like, um, a lot what, what Anne offers. She, she really looks at the way Benedictine life, the Benedictine way can offer insight into the climate crisis. Um, and I, I think this is becoming more and more clear that one of the gifts that the Catholic Church as an institution brings to the world right now, and it's clear from the way Pope Francis has, has uh, animated La Dato Si, is that we have an an institutional shell for carrying old, old wisdom. And some of that old wisdom is needed today for addressing uh, the really uh, historic, is that the right word? Um, anyway, addressing climate collapse. And so looking at the 15 year old tradition of, of Benedict is a, is a wonderful, uh, it's rich with wisdom. Um, Anne lives in the Lake Erie watershed and on the ancestral lands of the Seneca Nation. Uh, the Seneca Nation is the western door of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. And Anne, I'll let you go ahead and take us into looking at nonviolent practices related to the climate emergency. Okay, thank you very much. It's good to be with all of you and thank you for that, uh, Rose, it's good to be with you. Um, so just, um, this will be really broad, um, but I want to start with um, channeling uh, the Reverend James Lawson, who I had the real privilege of working with at the Fellowship of Reconciliation in the U.S. I was on the National Council when he was chairperson, and what he drilled into our heads and into my head was a nonviolent action are steps toward a goal, <laughs> that you have to know what your goal is. You have to be able to see it and then break it down. So every nonviolent tactic that's used should be in the direction of a goal and you should know where you're going. So um, he's my constant um, challenge in my, in my head. Um, when we look at the climate crisis, the climate emergency, the really, the goals are pretty clear. And I would say pretty clearly articulated in the global climate movement uh, from all of the different organizations working. So we know that we need to move away from fossil fuels, um, keep carbon in the ground, move to renewables. We need to save the forests that we have. We need to reduce meat consumption. We need to drastically reduce the carbon in the air and there's in the atmosphere and the, their, um, the goals are measurable. <laughs> we know where we are, we know where we're headed and we know we can't go where we need, we know where we need to go. Um, the 
global Catholic Cli climate covenant are now the Laudato Si movement, which is a wonderful name for that. And the Vatican De Dicastery for Integral Development have been really focused on those goals, but they have added their own. Um, uh, uh, Pope Francis with Laudato Si has added a very clear integral ecology and um, focused on the intersection of the issues. And also um, Laudato Si adds that at a very basic level, we're dealing with climate emergency and it can only be done with a change in a transformation of consciousness with a whole new relationship between humanity and the earth, which our Benedictine tradition would teach as uh, humility. Um, the nonviolent tactics that are being used globally are very strong. Um, so especially focused on preventing any new fossil fuel infrastructure or mines with large visible creative campaigns. Um, think of those fighting right now, the pipeline number, number three in Northern Minnesota. Um, climate strikes saying this is an emergency, stop business as usual, um, reaching out to governments, challenging government leaders. Um, climate strike is large and global and has the potential to involve people at every local level. Um, economic initiatives, the divestment campaign as a nonviolent strategy is more and more effective. And um, there's the next Catholic rollout from the Laudato Si movement of the Catholic institutions that have divested will be in October. And they make a big play with that um, so that people are aware of the movement. And 350.org just started a big uh, campaign two days ago focused on the Federal Reserve and the getting the Federal Reserve to divest. Um, consumer initiatives are growing and are very effective um, for climate. Um, creating the alternative. Um, so cre uh, community solar, regenerative agriculture, wind farms, so that people can see and feel and touch and taste what, this, what the solutions are that we need to move toward. As, um, and then uh, support and educate for um, collective and individual actions. I would say the, that the Laudato Si movement as a Catholic global community has added um, a real focus on education and action and the integration of those issues. So intentionally, whether we're working on racism or sexism or poverty issues or refugees, we um, know the connection of those issues and that the solutions are interrelated and intentionally working toward goals. So the roots of uh, ref the refugee crisis are rooted in climate emergency. Um, and so are the solutions to both of them are connected and interrelated. Another thing that the Laudato Si movement adds is um, worship and liturgies and prayer, bringing our Catholic community and our Catholic identity and our Catholic faith to bear on this issue in a visible, palpable way. Um, and then also working at the interfaith and interspiritual movements. Um, I would give just one example. Um, the 2017, the Adorers of the Blood of Christ in Columbia, PA, we're working with many others fighting the, um, in, in Lancaster against the pipeline um, in their area. And they built a chapel in their cornfield saying that uh, the pipeline would cut through their land and uh, or interrupt their religious space. It was a not only a prayerful place of worship, but it was a visual education protest interruption of pipeline construction. And I would say that the challenge, <coughs> excuse me, of, of um, nonviolence in climate, especially is the magnitude of the problem and the urgency with which, with which it must be addressed. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Anne, that's wonderful. Um, and yeah, really set a good, uh, 
practical outline for some of the ways that we can think about these things. Um, again, just to sort of do a little bit of strategic summary. I think as we, the, the, our morning uh, opening plenary gave us a sense of the breadth of nonviolence uh, as an interior practice, uh, as, a, uh, uh, as a philosophical or moral or ethical construct. Um, and then here we're, we will, we are talking about more specific examples of social movements. And so when we come to social movements, we have this quote from, from James Lawson, who is one of the premier um, American strategists uh, and Christians <laughs> um, uh, on, on the sort of tactics and goals of nonviolent movements. And so nonviolent actions, when they are used as a tactic, are only good if they are in the service of a very clear and strategic goal. Um, they, they really, they, 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 it, it, the danger of doing an unthought out nonviolent tactic is that it actually sort of uh, puts non, looks, makes nonviolent, puts nonviolence in a bad light because it doesn't have any context. It's not going anywhere. Um, and so that's a, that's a really important thing to remember. Every tactic that we use in nonviolence should be in the service of a really clear and thought through and prayerfully discerned, I would say, uh, goal. And, and some of those goals, um, we have the uh, ad advantage now of the last few years in the climate, climate emergency of having some pretty clear goals stated that are really well researched and uh, discerned within a global community, uh, discerned both on a spiritual way and in an economic way and a scientific way. So moving away from the use of fossil fuels, um, keeping fossil fuel in the ground, um, protecting forests with our, and other uh, large green areas that are the lungs of the earth, um, reduce the carbon in the atmosphere, invest in renewable energies, uh, reduce meat production. There are some very clear things as ANTA that are measurable. So that's part of, part of the clear goal is a measurable goal, an effective goal. Um, and, and then also this very important piece from, from the, the deep foundations of the Benedictine tradition that the way that we get to a transformation of consciousness, particularly as, as Catholics, but in an anthropological world, I think it's as humans, we get to it through humility. We get on the path to a transformation of consciousness through a, a, a return to the core virtue of humility, which means in, in my understanding, you're no better or worse than who God made you to be. <laughs> um, you, are, you are part of a community. You are not the center of the community. You are not on the outside of the community. You are held and part of a community and you are no better and no worse than who God made you to be. Um, Anne mentioned several of the, the tactics that are in use around climate uh, around the climate emergency, nonviolent tactics. So we we see uh, we see direct action at at pipelines, at mining situations, which are linked toward keeping fossil fuels in the ground. Uh, we see economic strikes and divestment. These are all uh, tactics that can be used to shift the economic structure toward a, a, a transformed uh, uh, transformed economics. Um, and then I think this, this, this call that is particular for people of faith to be living out the creative alternative, to embody the new creation. We are the people with religious imagination. And it's not to say other people don't have an imagination, but we in particular are called within our Christian tradition and our Catholic tradition to, and particularly Catholics, I'll just say that, uh, to sanctified religious imagination. And so we have the ability to think in just a very small way um, or in, in larger ways. How do we live the creative alternatives? 
And then I think just one more thing I want to touch on that Anne said that I think is very important is that we're we're very clear these days about the intersectionality of the injustice. So we're we're, uh, we're beginning to understand more that you know racism. Uh, it, 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 Racism and climate, well, you've got environmental racism. So communities of color are much more impacted by the climate crisis than white communities. So you've got the intersectionality of the injustice, but what Anne was encouraging us to look at is the intersectionality of the justice, <laughs> that the, the solutions are interconnected as well as the problems. And I think that's a rich uh, area for us to have some conversation about. All right, thank you so much, Anne. And we're gonna be moving to Scott. Uh, Scott Scott Wright, uh, we're delighted to have with us. Scott Wright has been an active member of Pax Christi since 1990. Uh, after working with the church in El Salvador and accompanying refugees and displaced communities um, during the Salvadoran War, he's written several books on the Salvadoran struggle and on St. Oscar Romero. And for the past eight years, Scott's served as the Justice, Peace, and Ecology Director of the Missionary Society of St. Columban, the Columbans, in Washington, D.C., um, where he works on climate change, migration, economic justice, uh, and peace and nonviolence. Um, he's married with Jean Stoken, and they have a, a daughter named Mora, who's 22. Scott lives in D.C. He lives in the Anacostia River watershed. Uh, which is home, as he said, to 800,000 people, 43 species of fish, 200 species of birds, um, and it's in the ancestral lands of the Anacostuans, um, neighboring the Piscataway and the Pamunkey peoples. So Scott's going to talk to us particularly about the U.S.-Mexico border from a transnational perspective and the nonviolent social movements that are happening on both sides of the border and, and even beyond. Scott, I will turn it to you. Um, thank you so much, Rose, for that introduction. <laughs> and thank you, Leo and Anne. Um, I was just picturing, you know, the sanctuary there in Belgium and in some of our churches here, and then and you painted a wonderful picture of those sisters in Pennsylvania creating an altar uh, in the path of that pipeline. So wonderful images. Um, and what, what I'd like to do a little bit is, is these are more impressions and explorations. Um, not only to look at the active nonviolence, but also to look at identity, cultural identity. Um, I, I think of what you both shared, Leo and Anne. Sanctuary is not only something we do, I think, or called to do, but hopefully it's who we are as human beings and as Christians. And the same thing in terms of caring for creation, that uh, it's, it's who we are and who were called by the, the climate emergency to, to really become more fully engaged. Um, so thank you both for that. Um, I just returned from 10 days in Honduras and I, I wanted to share two impressions with you that deeply impacted me. Um, as, as Rose mentioned, I'm, I'm going to sh talk a little bit about nonviolent social movements and human migration, but looking at it in, in three phases. The, the struggle of people to remain home in Central America, the migrant journey, and then living as immigrants in the US. Um, what's the thread that connects that journey? <laughs> and one of the things that deeply impacted me that this past visit to Honduras was how the global economy of exclusion and inequality, that phrase from Pope Francis, how deeply it is at the root of the violence that forcibly displaces people from their homes and lands 
exploits their vulnerabilities as migrants on the journey north, and then denies their human dignity, their human rights to asylum, a path to citizenship once they do cross if they are able to into the United States. The second thing, and I, I'd like to focus on this particularly, is what impacted me and the communities we visited uh, that were impacted by that economy, that extractive economy, uh, are the cultural roots of their nonviolent social movements. Something that, um, if it helps, I, I think about as a seed of gospel nonviolence. Um, many of those social movements in Central America employ traditional nonviolent tactics, but I, I think their cultural roots of nonviolence go much deeper. They include indigenous understandings of creation, border understandings on, of hospitality, and in the US immigrant understandings of community-based resistance. I think they invite us to explore the meaning of accompaniment and solidarity as nonviolent practices that honor the agency, the leadership, and the power of these social movements and communities. So it's, it's all interconnected, um, both the violence of the global economy, but also the social movements defending Mother Earth. And in, in that phrase that you held up and lifted up, Rose, of embodying, embodying the creative alternative. Um, so what are these seeds of nonviolence that correspond to those three phases of migration? So very briefly, um, in Honduras, in Central America, there are so many communities, some of them indigenous, impacted by extractive industries uh, that are destroying the environment, <coughs> Uh, and community leaders in those communities, like Berta Cáceres, uh, have been, um, uh, have been uh, assassinated for defending and protecting their sacred lands and sacred waters. Um, in all cases of those communities we visited, I was struck by how deep their attachment and love for their land and their waters was. Something we glimpsed, I think you mentioned Anne in the love of Native Americans for creation, example of Standing Rock Nation opposing the fossil fuel pipeline to defend, protect their sacred lands and rivers. Um, I think that deep love for the land and waters is a seed of nonviolence, something that deeply ties to the identity particularly of indigenous peoples, that includes a systemic critique of the violence of the capitalist global economy that's destroying creation, pillaging the earth uh, for the sake of profit. What about the journey north? And here I wanna call, recall a, something I heard from a Mexican immigrant a few years ago who said, we must not think about these massive migrations north as caravans, but rather as biblical exoduses. So just changing our language invites us to change the way we understand what is happening with migration. It's not that people want to leave their homes and families. It's a global economy of exclusion and inequality, making their lands in inhospitable, creating climate disasters, deadly droughts, food insecurity, violence against women, violence against nature, and criminalizing protests and including uh, state repression as a response. A couple of years ago, I witnessed what I would call a second seat of nonviolence and that's border hospitality. It, it happened during the Trump administration when five to 800 migrants a day were released from detention onto the streets of El Paso. 
The El Paso community responded by opening 25 churches, contracting out entire motels, and Bishop Seitz opening the diocesan grounds to shelter these migrants and families. For the people of the border communities, that border was imposed on them by a colonial history. By their solidarity and hospitality, these border communities were creating a bridge, not a wall, a nonviolent response that involved an entire community deeply tied to their identity. And finally, living as immigrants in the US, I remember on the very first day of the Trump administration, going to Lafayette Park in front of the White House to protest the Muslim ban. And there we met a Latino immigrant community organization that spontaneously and successfully organized a sit-in on 15th Street to block rush hour traffic and to protest, protest the Muslim ban. Many were undocumented and joined in the protest. And it, I'll always remember they, they chanted, it's our duty to fight for our freedom. It's our duty to win. We will love and care for each other. We have nothing to lose but our chains. So what impressed me that day and the day since is what I would call a third seed of nonviolence. That deep sense of solidarity and community-based resistance that's inclusive and bold. Over and over again, immigrant-led groups have engaged in many nonviolent tactics, but it's the coalition building across racial and generational lines that strikes me as a deeply cultural value, with dreamers from Mexico defending TPS holders from Central America and Haiti, mothers and children engaged in nonviolent resistance, and in one instance, Black civil rights veterans engaged in training undocumented Latino youth in the tradition and spirit of nonviolent resistance. To conclude, I look at these nonviolent social movements along the migrant trail and find great hope in their diversity and creativity. One key question that I see the nonviolent movement wrestling with from within is a deeper understanding of how institutional and cultural violence impacts people of color and how difficult it is to build trust and commitment across the diversity of our communities. We all have a role to play and discerning those roles together are crucial aspects of building effective nonviolent social movements over the long haul. Thank you. Thank you, Scott, very much. That's wonderful. Um, so we, we hear from, from Scott these uh, nonviolent social movements and the creative solidarity that he has encountered and that's uh, blossoming along the migrant trail in the context and amid uh, situations of, of violence, whether institutional state violence, um, interpersonal violence, uh, cultural violence. And, and I hear you, Scott, really helping us about what are our cultural identities. And I think in particular for, for Euro-Americans, this is very difficult. Um, we, we don't know what our cultural identities are. We've become too assimilated um, and it's, it's difficult for us to begin to uncover those, but that's also a practice of nonviolence um, is, is a, a, on the road to humility, <laughs> to learn who we are as Euro-Americans in the, in the American um, experiment and to begin to find our, the virtues in that, um, that can be positive contributions to this creative solidarity um, and, uh, and, and in the same way that we can look to the ancient wisdom in our churches and in our biblical tradition, we can also, and, and I would say, you know, humbly 
um, approach indigenous communities um, gently and humbly alongside them to begin to, to listen in as, as they allow on their pre-capitalist, pre-colonial wisdom and, um, and nonviolent survival strategies. So that's, that's also an invitation. Um, and then beginning to understand our contemporary social movements with our biblical imagination. So to begin to say, not migrant caravans, but exoduses. Exoduses from, from slavery, um, of the, the, the you know, slavery-like violence, violence becoming in, uh, uh, an oppressive force, um, to something different and whether it is a promised land or not in some ways depends on the context of hosp hospitality in which people are received. So beginning to apply our biblical imagination to our contemporary social movements. Um, and maybe Scott, you didn't, say this overtly, but it felt implied is a sense of personal relationship that in border communities, um, it, on both sides of the Mexico and US border, people understand that the border is a construct, that their families, their cousins live on both sides. That um, And how do we begin to have that same sense uh, that I think developing that sense of seeing borders as an important part of nation states, but not an ultimate, um, particularly for us as Catholics, the sense of our family, our kinship groups, um, it, these, these are the bedrock. And so how do we really cultivate relationships in such a way that uh, that allow for creative responses um, and really build an authentic uh, solidarity. So we, we want to stop here for a moment, and I'm just going to uh, maybe ask Roxana if, if there's a, a piece of music you have to put on um, just three minutes while either we run to the bathroom um, uh, stretch a second, but really to just reflect on what we've heard thus far. And as you're doing that reflecting, just drop a word or a phrase um, or concept, an image, something that touched you, just drop it in the chat. Um, and then we'll also come back in about three minutes and, uh, and begin to ask some questions, uh, bring some uh, uh, prophetic interrogation into our conversation. Me levanto temprano, fresco y curado, claro y feliz. Y te digo voy al bosque para aliviarme de ti. Sabe que dentro tengo un tesoro que me llega a la raíz. Si luego vuelvo cargado con muchas flores, mucho color y te las pongo en la risa, en la ternura, en la voz. Es que he mojado en flor mi camisa para teñir su sudor. Pero si un día me demoro, no te impaciente, yo volveré más tarde. 
será que la más profunda alegría me habrá seguido la rabia ese día la rabia simple del hombre silvestre la rabia bomba la rabia de muerte la rabia imperio asesino de niños la rabia se me ha podrido el cariño la rabia madre por dios tengo frío la rabia es mío eso es mío solo mío la rabia vivo pero Y hay días que vuelvo cansado, sucio de tiempo, sin paramo. Es que regreso del mundo, no del bosque, no del sol. En esos días, compañera, ponte alma nueva. Thank you so much. Anna, for the beautiful music, for the comments that people have put chat box. I encourage our, our panelists to just look through those if you haven't. Um, <clears throat> it's very helpful. So as we uh, said, um, or Johnny said in the in the opening plenary, this what we what we're doing here, we're a little bit at the um, uh, at the mercy of the technology, but we're doing a little bit of a, a fishbowl where we have our panelists sort of sitting in and and having a conversation with one another. Um, and I want to offer a, a little bit before we put some questions to our panelists. I'll put some and I'll take some from, from uh, what's been in the chat uh, to just help, help uh, clarify and discern together and ask questions and, and raise some of the, the, as I said early on, some of the naughty questions, the things that are like, ah, these are a little, it's hard to unpack. Some things are complex, you know, um, and, and help us all gain a little bit of a, a deeper understanding of how this, uh, this power of nonviolence is, is active and dynamic, not only in social movements today, but also within our church and how we can be um, animators, um, reflectors, uh, energizers um, of nonviolence in our uh, in our own situations. But the nonviolent movement that we didn't address specifically in in this panel is the broadest and biggest nonviolent movement this country has ever seen, which is the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and Part of the reason we didn't address it here is because that will be the bulk of what Olga Segura uh, talks about tomorrow at the Pax Christi USA National Conference. And her writing and insight, um, analysis, and just 
creative interaction with um, with really understanding deeply the 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 historical context uh, of the Black Lives Matter movement and what it means within the Catholic Church are, are just uh, invaluable. It's invaluable. So um, if, if if perhaps you were thinking of sneaking out and not going to tomorrow's national conference, please listen to Olga on this. But a, a couple of things I want to just mention about the Black Lives Matter movement, which, which I've worked with uh, a lot through Sojourners, is you know, just a couple of things. When, when we see, um, you know, especially if you're just watching it on TV or on online, social media, whatever, when we see this sort of uh, protests breaking out into the street, um, these are, especially in the, in, in the Black Lives Matter movement, these are not just, uh, what do I wanna say, expressions of outrage. These are all built out of decades of black organizing. And while they may come together quickly in a response to a, a particularly horrible situation that's happened, they are deeply embedded in long time relationships and organizing and strategic thinking. Um, and they are the public manifestation of a much larger and deeper social analysis um, and agenda that, that we all uh, need. Um, the, the, a lot of the media attention, especially last summer on the Black Lives Matter movement, because right in, in American media, what's the old phrase? If it bleeds, it leads. <laughs> but, that if it's if it's a, if it's a violent conflict, then that's what the media uh, picks up on, and uh, and then when you add in social media, you've got algorithms that that uh, that um, sort for conflict. So a conversation, uh, particularly in white communities, not only white communities, but particularly in white communities that came up in the Black Lives Matter movement was well, but there are protesters who are being violent. So we can't support them. Well, that's craziness. Number one, 97% of the Black Lives Matter protests were nonviolent public witness. And so don't let the distortions of an algorithm or of media or whatever uh, distort your perspective because we are dedicated to looking at truth and digging a little deeper and asking a deeper question um, about what's what's happening, so um, and then I, I think the the third thing I would say is what a good social movement does is it pushes space for asking some bigger paradigm shifting questions, and the Occupy movement uh, a few years back did that on the economy. You never heard NPR talking about economic inequality, using the word inequality until the Occupy movement. And suddenly there's a conversation happening in the United States about what is economic inequality? So if nothing else, and I think the Occupy movement contributed quite a lot to our conversation, but if nothing else, it brought into mainstream parlance an understanding that we could analyze our economy from the point of view of looking at its inequalities. Um, and the Black Lives Matter movement is doing a tremendous amount to deal with mass incarceration, to deal with police brutality, uh, to do with economic injustice, housing issues. There's a tremendous amount of work uh, that is being brought forward out of the Black Lives Matter movement. And I want to say one of the things is that it is forcing us to think in a paradigm shifting way about policing. You know, and that's just amazing. So in the same way, don't get attracted, you know, don't get your, don't let your, your eyes go to the small percentage of protesters who might have broken a window. Also, don't get distracted by defund the police is just a completely unrealistic thing. Don't get distracted by language that you don't immediately understand. 
ask the deeper questions. So, you know, just taking that one, one phrase, uh, because it's such an important concept. When we talk about defunding public education or defunding, uh, you know, the damage that's been done by all the defunding of other social structures. So then let's talk about defunding the police, not for the purpose of ending uh, community security, but for the purpose of investing in security and communal stability that works, that's effective. And so that sort of transferring of thinking about what does community security really mean? And are there effective nonviolent forms of community security that will build stability over time? rather than relying on a militarized policing to deal with social issues, which is where we have ended up through a whole bunch of complex decisions. So I just wanna, I, I wanna make sure that we've got the Black Lives Matter movement in our mind because that is the uh, quintessential social movement in the United States uh, right now that we're seeing a lot of. And Olga will talk about that a lot, um, I think, tomorrow. So let's, um, oh, David's saying Olga will speak tonight. Okay, good, thank you, sorry. Um, check the chat to correct me on my, on my scheduling issues. Um, 7, 7.30 Eastern time. So- we'll Start at seven. Sorry, it'll start, start at, at seven. Starts at seven, good, thank you. Um, Leo, I want to put this question to you because I think it unpacks a, a, a lot of, um, it, it's, it's a really deep and good question that came out of the chat. Is, is this, sanctuary, when you talk about sanctuary, is sanctuary, is the emphasis on the physical protection or is it on prophetic witness? Thank you, Roche. And I have a, litany of all the questions and my responses to them. So I'll just try to weave maybe a few things here in, in the, for the sake of time. Um, what greater prophetic witness can we think of but the protection of life because we see life as sacred in a world of mass violence of various forms. So that would be like one very short way of, of, of perhaps responding. Um, I, so I don't wanna separate. Uh, prophetic witness from physical protection. Um, I think we can separate, this is in relation to another question, churches, a physical structure of a church from um, a broader understanding of sanctuary. And I think um, Scott phrased it beautifully. You know, it's not something we do, although it is also something we do, but it's out of who we are. It's something we do because of who we are. And so we protect life because of um, the need to witness, for, at least for us, out of our faith to a God that we believe is a God of life. Um, so I, I, that would be my way of responding to that, um, to that particular question. Um, I, would, I would love to go into some of the other questions on sanctuary, but, but maybe Rose, you, you let me know if either I should take another minute or two or just... Yeah, sure, go ahead. Okay, great. So um, the whole notion of civil um, disobedience and like in uh, communities taking initiative, actually in the 1980s, uh, they did not use, or did, there were some discussions and conflicts, but they did not want to use civil disobedience. They wanted to emphasize the civil initiative. Why? It is basic communities, human communities taking initiative for the protection of life, um, and in, behind this was actually the Nuremberg trials, and this gets into another question or comment that was put there. You know, when, when uh, the government falls apart, essentially, that's in a situation where you need communities literally to take that initiative that is beyond conceptions of whatever loss may remain within, we could call it a, a fallen state, um, to affirm um, life of others. Um, hospitality has been brought up. Uh, I would want to just emphasize that the root, like at the, at the root, uh, etymologically speaking, of hospitality, you are always both guest and host. You're not offering 
uh, it's not a one-way thing where you're where the church off just offering. You know, you, it, it, at the root, at least, it, you're always both guest and host. So theologically, some theologians have spoken about it in a way we receive ourselves and receiving the other, or more theologically, we're actually receiving the presence of God coming into our churches because there's nothing that guarantees that our churches are necessarily where the God's presence dwells. But we do have a great theology that says God's presence dwells where human life is threatened. We could call it the poor from a liberation theology perspective. Another question came up about the history. I'll just say within the law of the Roman Catholic Church, canon law, it was codified in the 400s within law. And it was there till, the, the, till 1983 when the new code of canon law came about. They did away with it. And the discussions are really fascinating. And I'll put a link and maybe a copy of the article that draws that out for you what happened. Um, but they essentially did away with any reference to it in the 80s as the sanctuary movement was um, happening. And about insurance, you know, someone talked about legality. The Episcopal Church now offers for $100 a year, your parish can be insured for $100,000 so that you can cover your legal fees when you, in fact, decide and discern that the Holy Spirit is calling this community to take the prophetic stance of protecting human life. What an amazing creative response, rather than just saying, no, we can't, or it's illegal. Where does the Spirit actually call us into creative ways of being? Um, I know Bishop Tobin, and in my article, I critique, uh, I, I think respectfully, but also firmly, uh, the bishop's stance um, that they cannot give false hope in protection. I'll speak as some, uh, someone who came illegally to this country, to use that word, um, someone who did not have these protections. And I can tell you that many, well, any undocumented person that seeks protection in a church knows very well that no bishop no congregation, no building, no set of bricks can protect them from the government if the government really wants to go after them. But boy, does it buy them a lot of time for creativity, for the community to come together. Um, and this is where, and I'll end with this, this is where I think it's really also important, and this may be pushing back a bit on the distinction of tactics and goals or tactics and strategies. I do think there's a danger in making a goal and working so directly for that because we foreclose, I think, um, enough space for the Holy Spirit and grace to happen in the process. Um, and so how do we live in this present moment responding to the immediate need? Yes, having a direction, yes, having a strategy, yes, having a goal, but, but as Gandhi would say, the means becomes the end. The present is really what we have to deal with and the loss of human life in the present. And I'll end with that. Thank you. Um... Leo and Anne, I want to direct this question to you, and there may be some others that you've seen in the chat, but um, how do we, we had this conversation of microaggressions in the opening panel, which I think is a, that I think of microaggressions if, when we are able to handle them well as just really a, a tiny everyday opportunity to deepen relationships. And um, when we can have those, those kinds of conversations where somebody can say, whoa, that really landed wrong. <laughs> and somebody else can say, ah, I didn't intend that, but I recognize, well, that probably landed wrong. Let's talk about it. So somebody's asking, how do we understand microaggressions in terms of creation, cre nature, in terms of creation, in terms of our way of understanding ourselves in the natural world? Thoughts on that, Anne? Yeah, well, just um, I would point to, um, I, I think the Dr. C talks about that um, relationship. Um, so, and Robin Wall Kinner, Kimmerer in uh, the book Braiding Sweetgrass and in some of her other re uh, work really talks about the, really the essential indigenous wisdom that um, embedded in their language is a different relationship with with other be it's not an object uh, nature is not an object it's a um it, it, it's a being and it's um a verb um water is a verb water is is its own being that we that that also fills us so it's um i i have to keep reading her over and over but this like 
breaking open our spirit. And I like what you said, Leo, about, um, and I want to come back to that, but this, this breaking open our consciousness, getting out of the programmed boxes and ways of seeing um, and the ways that we pray and worship, <laughs> like bringing that into our prayer and worship is going to be incredibly important. And I, I don't know about uh, you all, but I can see little shifts um it, you know from you know our taking care of the earth in petitions to something much deeper than that um two things that i, I just want to uh, two things that sparked in me leo when you were talking um and we didn't really pull up but i but you you talked about community and i think for all of these issues and in using um and in the Catholic community using nonviolence, it's a community endeavor. And the community is beyond, of course, the parish and the, you know, beyond, beyond Catholic, beyond human. But um, I think when I first learned nonviolence, I learned more of the solitary hero. And that's, those stories are still important, but it's the nonviolent community. And I think that's what we're um, hoping to realize. And then just to uh, refer to when you, when you um, uh, about the goals being too narrow, I would say that just as a answer to that, that I didn't meant the, mean the goals to be narrow. I mean, the goals are huge and the goals are a direction and the goals need a broad, Every every goal um, in nonviolence has has had a broad range of tactics, and and new tactics and creative tactics, and everyone in the community can participate in a nonviolent movement. Um, and but it's that it's that direction to kind of know where we're going. Um, why is this action important, and what how does it connect with what the um, Catholics in the Philippines are doing because we're on the same page. We're praying together. We're acting together. We're connected. Good. Thank you so much. And, mm -hmm. and, and Scott, I want to direct this um, as we sort of begin to uh, wind down, but direct this to you. So you, I think you in particular are a person who is extremely skilled at into a community situation and um, finding your place in it and being a person who does uh, either recognize the seed of nonviolence in the context and help uncover it or planting that seed um, in the community and helping the community really uh, look at things in a new way. And I wonder like, what are just on a very basic level, Scott, what, how do you do that? Um, well, we help each other, I think. <laughs> I don't, I don't know, really. Um, I mean, I think relationship is important. Um, and I think shared risk in community is important. I, I, I think the community dimension of answering your question is, is exceptionally important because we, we can't figure it out alone. And, and in our own homogenous communities, whatever that might be by race, class, gender, whatever, you know, I think we, we truly need each other and we truly need to approach uh, one another with uh, a real humility because our experiences are different within you know within the uh, within the the life that we share the economy social life church and I, i'll just share a, a very personal story um it it struck me on this this visit but it goes back some years uh we visited uh, Berta Casares community in Honduras. Um, she's the Lenca indigenous woman that was um, 
killed in, in 2016, I believe. And her, two of her daughters were there and carrying on. It was quite inspiring just to see that. Um, and the community we visited, you know, they began uh, one with greeting us with hospitality. Secondly, on this dirt floor outside, uh, it was covered with just a little roof, they had a little altar. With, uh, represented their Lincoln cosmovision, and they lit lit candles representing the different uh, four directions, and invited us to do the same. So, in a sense, they were inviting us into a different world. Um, their cosmovision, but a different world because they were also living on land uh, that they didn't have title to. Um, they had, uh, you know, I think it was indigenous territories that are rec recognized uh, with international rights, but they were constantly being threatened and by vigilante groups and others. So, I mean, we were, we were invited into a, a completely different world in which we went with a great deal of privilege um, and protection. So, you know, you feel deep gratitude, but when you leave, you, you feel like that memory has a claim on our life. Hopefully our lives will be different. Uh, we'll live with that dis discomfort. Why is the world constructed this way where uh, indigenous communities, the Berta Castres, are killed for protecting and defending their communities, their sacred lands, their sacred rivers. And when before Berta died, um, and, and she's somebody that uh, we had known for about 20 years before she was killed, um, just through different work that we participated in. Can you draw but, to a close, uh, Scott, when convenient? Yeah, what, one of her last um, words was, at, at when she received the Goldman Environmental Prize. And she very, um, very eloquently and without rhetoric at all, I think it re represents her identity, uh, pointed out that capitalism, racism, and patriarchy were the oppressions against which her community was struggling for life. And so that's all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, uh, Leo and Anne and Scott uh, and Roxana for uh, helping to make this a, a vibrant um, panel and discussion. And thank you for everyone's comments and thoughtful engagement um, for all of the, the words that you put uh, in reflection out of our conversation. Um, I hope that what you take from this is you know, just one or two things that's perhaps a question. Uh, we'd say the questions prompt the quest. So, you know, what's a, what's a really legitimate, interesting, authentic question for you out of this conversation that might give you something to do a little thinking about, a little reading about, talking to others about, praying about, and just listen to what the Holy Spirit is, is saying to you out of this conversation. Um, as we uh, close, I'm gonna invite us just to close in a, in a very traditional Catholic way, but I find when we're wrestling with the Holy Spirit who may sometimes be asking us to do something we're not sure we wanna do or is pushing us to our boundaries, um, it's always uh, good to, to turn to Mary and uh, who, who who knows what we are struggling with. So I invite us to just uh, close with um, praying the, the Hail Mary together. And then this room will close automatically in about three minutes and we'll send us back into the, the main room. So please join me. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death.
Go with peace to love and serve the Lord. Thank you.